Yep, starting right now. All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the fourth workshop in Build with AstroDB series heading towards Build a Modern Data App Hackathon happening from September 3rd to 5th. We have an amazing session lined up today for all of you. At any point in this workshop through the next 50 odd minutes, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A box and we'll pick them up. So what are we going to talk about today? Before we, I get to that, we have uh, Asta and I are from the AngelAct team. Nathan is from uh, Circle Media Labs, who is our panelist today and the speaker who's going to share his insights and how they use Astra at Circle Media Labs. And then we have Sean, of course, Bala and Eric from uh, Datastax and NIIT, the experts on Astra DB. With that, let's get it into the agenda. So I'll quickly share what this hackathon is about and then uh, jump into what AstraDB is and how you can quickly get started with AstraDB. And then we'll listen to the story of Circle Media Labs from Nathan and ask him a few questions as to how they use uh, AstraDB and what are some quick uh, tips and tricks for all the beginners out here in this workshop today. And uh, yeah, if you post some questions, we'll take them at the end, I guess. With that, what is this hackathon? This hackathon is about building any app that you want to build around AstraDB which is happening from September 3rd to 5th. And uh, the top three winners from this hackathon will not just get cash prizes, but also will get a direct entry into Datastax incubator program starting on September 9th. So what is the catch of this hackathon or what is the theme? We don't have any specific themes. If you have a problem that you want to solve, go ahead and solve it by using AstraDB as your core. So make sure you have AstraDB as the core of your application. Just don't submit the sample apps that you try. Right, build an app that is really solving a problem. And how to participate? If you are in the Zoom call, you know this already. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just go ahead to our website, scan the QR code from the first slide or the last slide, and sign up for the hackathon. And then you'll get all the links to join the AstraDB platform, uh, the Slack channel that we are running, and the Telegram channel. And also, all the mentors are accessible on Slack as well. So. Make sure you follow all of these steps and get started with the hackathon, guys. I don't know what you're doing if you haven't signed up yet. We're just two weeks away, and these are the prizes. We have top three winners taking away 5,000 USD, 3,000 USD, and 2,000 USD in that same order. And we also have a Hacker's Choice Award where all the participants get to vote their favorite projects once they are submitted on September 5th. And that prize is also $2,500. Uh, I really wish I was participating in this hackathon, but uh, sad story for organizers. We can't really do that. But apart from that, we have at least six more prizes that you can take away apart from just being the winner. So make sure you check all of these out on our website. With that, we are here today at our fourth workshop heading towards the hackathon. And we have one last workshop next weekend, followed by a team building and networking session. If you're on Slack already, you know how to join that session. We have an amazing platform where you can network with people live and also pitch your idea. Hackathon starts on September 3rd and ends on September 5th. We have mentor office hours through two days and also we'll teach you how to make a beautiful pitch video that you'll submit about your project. So if you're still wondering why you should sign up, you should probably go ahead and sign up right now. And with that, we'll jump into our uh, session today. We have Sean and Nathan. Sean is the developer community's lead at Datastax and Nathan is the principal engineer at Circle Media Labs. Over to you, gentlemen, to take this over, and I'll jump in back at the end to get to the Q&A. All right, thank you, Harish. Welcome, everybody. I mentioned it before. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are very happy to have you here with us. Uh, today, we're actually just going to take a couple of minutes to discuss Astra, and then we're going to switch over and focus on Nathan and the Circle use case. The reason why we're doing that today is because their use case will show you the true options that you can build on AstraDB, and plus, Nathan's use case is way more interesting than our conversation anyway. So that's always a bonus for everyone here. Now, Harisha already mentioned to everyone uh, that this hackathon is not just a one-off hackathon. Of course, you can just win money and walk away, no problem. However, if you want to change your life, this is the hackathon for you. Why do I say that? 
Because if you get your idea to be um, entered into the incubator program, what it will offer you is a chance to change your life. It will give you the chance to learn how to become a startup. You're basically bringing your idea from an app to a startup. How do you get to be, uh, how do you get funding? How do you become a startup? Basically, how to become the next unicorn of Silicon Valley. And does this mean that you need to be in Silicon Valley? Absolutely not. This is a global event. Everyone is welcome, no matter what. All right. So now that we got the commercials out of the way, now let's talk about Astra DB. So I have my friends Bala and Eric with me today. For those of you who are returning, which is quite a few, you are already familiar. For those of you who are not familiar with both of these two gentlemen, let me uh, allow them to introduce themselves. They are absolutely phenomenal. My friend, mentor, and colleague Bala, he is the um, Center of Excellence VP, I believe now, or president. He got promoted recently uh, from NIIT and resident um, data stacks and Apache Cassandra subject matter expert. Bala, please introduce yourself to the fine people. Oh, I think you've done all the introductions, Sean. Nothing more. <laughs> I would just tell, tell people that I'm a humble fan of data stacks and everything that they do. So I've been with them doing the thing for quite a number of years, along with Sean and others. So love to be a part of this journey, this hackathon and the design, this lovely bunch of people. Thank you, Sean, for inviting and Asta and Hari. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, and then for those of you who are not familiar with Eric Ramirez, um, Eric is, and I, I use this reference all the time, he's like Bugs Bunny in that um, baseball cartoon. He is everywhere. If you have a question about Apache Cassandra or you've ever posted a question about Apache Cassandra somewhere on the internet, there is a high probability that Eric has been the one either responding or Eric has been the second person responding because he is literally everywhere. He is our, um, our knowledge database uh, personified. Eric, would you like to introduce yourself to the fine people? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm very happy to um, be here. Um, welcome to um, another uh, live stream for uh, preparing for the hackathon. So um, Eric Ramirez, uh, Cassandra enthusiast, from data stack. So um, just hit us up with any questions you have. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so obviously that's gonna bring us to the next, uh, the next topic, which is gonna be AstroDB. For most of the people who get on calls like this and they, they talk about AstroDB, it's all about marketing and sales, right? Forget all that. Let's move all of that to the side. Here's the reason why I say that. I work for data stacks because I'm a fan of Cassandra. I'm not a fan of Cassandra because I work for data stacks, right? So regardless of my status with the company, Apache Cassandra is going to be in my life moving forward. Now, why is that important? Because historically it was so difficult to get Apache Cassandra uh, set up and configured and running properly. It was always just, you know, it was an uphill climb. AstroDB is here to make our lives easier. Now, why do I say that? Because you can literally start your very own database in five clicks. I kid you not, it is five clicks. And to prove this point, Harish actually made a uh, video a couple of weeks ago where he, he kind of challenged the notion of, can I truly set a database up in five clicks and deploy my own Netflix clone in 10 minutes? If anybody doesn't believe that this is actually possible, Harish made a 15 minute video that includes breathing time and talking time where he was able to not only set up his own AstroDB uh, database, but also deploy his very own Netflix clone. So because of that, that is why AstroDB is so important. Next slide, please. Because when you look at all of the tools that are available to you, I'm gonna ask Bala to introduce some of these features to you and why they're important. Bala, why are these tools important for the people looking to use AstroDB? Well, I think number one, I think what you said just a um, few minutes ago is very important. The ease that Astra brings to the table is phenomenal. And I think Stargate is, uh, is, is perhaps the thing that comes up straight away, right? A uniform interface to a variety of methods of talking to Astra, right? They're all kind of abstracted away. The user just has to look at one, you know, gateway to talk to it, right? So that's a fantastic feature and developers love it. And uh, my favorite, as I always say in these, in these talks, is the metrics dashboard, 
right? That's where the real value comes in. I'm a great believer that in any kind of infrastructure database or otherwise, it's very important to monitor, to know what's happening, right? In order to proactively do something about it, right? So these metric dashboards, again, we don't reinvent the wheel. We've used what is available, right? And built a fantastic, you know, abstraction over it. And of course, the shell and the data stacks bulk loader have been there for a while. Mm -hmm. Good for, you know, executing commands. Bulk loader makes the job of getting data onto Astra so much more easier. So all this, the combined effort of all these makes Astra a really powerful database to use. Nice. I think that's very powerful. Next slide, please. So a lot of people have asked us, what if I want to learn more than just like simple click, click, click. So there are a couple of different avenues available and Eric can tell us some more about these learning opportunities. Eric, you have been on a lot of these videos. Do you have any tips, tricks for the people who are attending today? Yeah, so um, if you're completely new to Cassandra, and even if you've been using Cassandra for a while now, highly recommend you go to datastacks.com slash dev. We've got lots of free hands-on um, tutorials there um, where you can learn Cassandra, learn how to use, to connect to the database using the Stargate API. So it allows you to connect to the um, to your Cassandra instance using REST, RESTful APIs, GraphQL, and um, you can even do JSON doc API. Um, so, and we also have um, weekly workshops. So every, every week we run, you know, um, at least two to four workshops. Um, they're all free. Um, and to get information about that, just visit um, datastacks.com slash workshops. Nice. All right. Now, I know I promise no sales or marketing, but how about I give you a solution to your pain points? Did we mention stuff is free? Everything we're talking about is all free. Now, what does that mean? If you sign up for your AstroDB um, database, you get $25 uh, for free every month. Now, that said, what does that equal? Because $25 is very ambiguous. It equals about 4 million reads, about a million and a half writes, and give or take 40 gigabytes of data storage. So with that, you can do a tremendous amount for free. You can get certified for free. You can get swag for free. Why is this important? Because we love you guys. We love all of you, male, female, and otherwise. We're here for you. It's about all of you and being successful. Next slide, please. So once we sign up, right, we do have some options for you to look at. Some of you uh, have already joined us because I, I recognize a lot of your uh, names. Some of you already joined us for some previous videos where we built a Netflix clone or we looked at building a, net, or a, net, or a TikTok clone. So inside of your dashboard, there is the sample apps gallery. These sample apps are all very easy to follow. They're all differing levels. They go from beginner to advanced and everybody is able to do this by themselves. They can deploy code immediately in their, in their dashboard. You don't have to install anything. It will help you do everything that you need to do, but it will also give you some tips and tricks on how to be better. Now that said, um, I want to make sure that we give enough time to our panelist, Nathan Buck, because he is here. Can we go to the next slide, please? And um, make sure that everybody is aware that once you have your idea, you could become the next circle. You could become the next, you know, super startup. That's what we're here to learn about, right? Because I can tell you all the great things and try to convince everybody here why it's a good idea to sign up and tell you about all the free stuff. But eventually, you know, that's all just words. Circle actually has a use case to show the true uses, usage of an AstroDB deployment and what this means for you. So I know this is a little bit further than where we are with the hackathon, but this is the next phase after the hackathon that we talked about, where you could become a startup, where you could become the next unicorn. And that's where I would like to hand it back to Harish and Nathan to take it away and teach you about their use case and their usage of Astra. Gentlemen, please take it away. I guess that's me. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So, hi, I'm Nathan Bach. I'm the principal engineer at, at Circle Media Labs. Um, my wife and I have four children and we live in the, the Portland, Oregon area. So it's um, not yet 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning for me. So if I look tired, it's because I am. Um, 
just a little bit about me. I enjoy things like hiking and biking. I like to make things, everything from um, woodworking to tinkering around with microprocessors. And um, I love Japanese literature. Um, previously to joining um, Circle, I had various lives and jobs, um, including Novell, Quark, Rational, IBM. And yes, I even worked at Data Stacks and worked on the Astra um, project. Um, so um, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so I work at Circle and Circle's mission is that we make families' lives better online and off. And, and that's something that's really important to me because as I said, I've got kids and so that's important. And one thing that I think is great about working at Circle is it's the, the first job that I've ever had that I feel that I can explain to my mother what I actually do. So what is it that we do at Circle? Let's move to the next slide, please. All right, so we provide parental controls for um, internet enabled devices. And you know we've got a ton of different features and you can see those different icons um, talking about those. For example, filtering, that's basically letting parents decide what sorts of um, websites and apps that their family can access. We also let you track usage and history I'll quickly distinguish between history and usage because that will become um, important in our data discussion a little bit later. But history is like, you know, at this minute on this day, um, I went to YouTube and, and Google.com. Whereas usage is more like um, this past week, I spent far too many hours on YouTube. Um, you can, with Circle, we let people set time limits, um, you know, so that you know, you can set it for overall internet access per day, you know, only 10 hours of internet a day or four hours a day or whatever is appropriate for your family. And you can also set specific limits, which um, sometimes even is good for adults. So like maybe only four hours of YouTube a day. Um, you can set bedtimes to turn off the internet at um, certain times. And then focus times is something that was near and dear to my heart last year while my kids were doing online school. Focus time basically um, when my kids were supposed to be in their online schooling, they could access all of the educational websites that they needed to do their schooling and things like that. But things like social media, online gaming, and those sorts of websites were turned off um, during those times. And then as soon as school was over, click, it, they were magically able to do you know, all of their internet goodness and help avoid distractions. Um, you, you can also pause the internet. You can... Um, if they have the app on their phone, you can use it to locate your kid. And if your kid's good and you wanna give them a extra screen time, um, we've got a reward mechanism. So those are just some of the features that um, we have in our, our core product. So let's go to the, the next slide, please. Today, I wanna to talk about um, the three problems and these are all data related problems. Um, and these are, are growth um, and then creating new use cases and moving quickly. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these in a, a minute. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, at Circle, we're a cloud company. We have, a, we have a lot of different types of devices connecting to our cloud. And as is often the case in these sorts of diagrams is, is this cloud is just this nebulous cloud and it, it's kind of analogous to hand waving. Uh, let's jump to the next slide because whenever I see a cloud like that, I have questions about, you know, what's the platform, what's the programming language and things like that. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because that's a little bit off topic, but um, our cloud stuff is mostly on AWS. We're using Kubernetes and Docker Compose, and we have a bunch of microservices that are written mostly in Go. And along with that, we have lots of data. Um, we have various types of databases, relational databases, NoSQL databases, and, and of course, Astra. We started using Astra um, earlier this year, just a few months ago, actually, but our, our use with it has been growing. Um, but even apart from databases, you know, we store data in lots of other places, including memory caches, file systems, and S3 buckets. Uh, next slide, please. 
So at Circle, we deal with lots of different types of data. Um, there's three different types of data. You know, we've got the account and config type data, you know, with people's names and contact information, and also, you know, their where they are and time zone, things like that. Um, we're not going to talk about that really because, well, that's important stuff. I, I think that's a, pr a pretty common use case to store, you know, configuration and account information. We also do categorization. Um, so when, you know, the internet's constantly changing. And so when a new website comes online, we need to be able to categorize it to determine, you know, whether it's an educational website that you want your kids to visit or whether maybe it's a, a website that that's not so appropriate for children. Um, th this is definitely an, a very interesting um, type of data that we deal with and something that we do. But um, today I mostly wanna focus on our history and usage because um, we're able to provide parents information about their family's internet usage, including you know, the, the sites um, different family members are visiting, you know, or, or the apps that they're using. And, and there's things like packed accounts and then also what sites are, are blocked. And we do this every minute per account, per profile, per device. So, you know, we've got lots of customers and each customer, you can have multiple profiles in an account. You know, in my case, I've got lots because I've got lots of kids. And then each profile can have lots of devices. And so when you're thinking about the internet usage for all of those accounts, all of those profiles and all of those devices every minute, that becomes a lot of data very quickly. And so that's really cool stuff, but it, it also creates various problems. So let's go to the next slide, please. So growth. Growth is, is a great problem to have. Um, it's better than the alternative when you're a startup company. Um, but there are problems. Um, one problem can be right-sizing your database or instance. You know, th this is very tricky because a lot of times you don't know exactly how much, you know, how big your database needs to be. And, you know, if you're spinning up your own EC2 instance or whatever, it's hard to get it at the right magnitude and it's easy to get it wrong. And then you have to resize or, or tweak things or whatever. So a thing that I really like about Astra is that it's got that elastic scaling. Um, another problem that you can run into with growth, did we jump back? Okay, thank you, um, is, is hard limits. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to store data. And, you know, if you don't have a lot of data, it doesn't matter too much how you store your data because it'll be fine. But once you get, you know, large numbers of, of records, um, you can very quickly hit, you know, physical limits. If you're storing your information on a hard drive, hard drives are very fast, but there's a physical limit to, you know, how much you can read and write in, in a second. And, you know, Astra's got Cassandra backing it, which means it can scale up, you know, to crazy high numbers. Um, and then again, predicting and balancing the workload and storage size is difficult. Um, sometimes you have a database with a ton of data that um, you know, is only infrequently accessed, or sometimes you have the opposite where you have just a, you know, a small set of data, but it, you know, has to be, it has to work crazy hard to handle all of, all of the requests. And a neat thing about Astra is that compute and storage are separated. So you can easily handle you know, either of those extreme scenarios or anywhere in between. And, and finally, um, with growth, sometimes something that works today, you go over a limit or something like that and it breaks tomorrow and that can cause people to have to wake up in the middle of the night and bleary-eyed trying to figure out you know, what caused the database to crash and burn. With Astra, you don't have to be a database expert. You just have to, you know, watch the video, do the five clicks, and bam, you've got a database. Um, let's jump to the next slide, please. So one thing we've been doing a lot with at Circle, with Astra specifically, is to do proof of concepts with new use cases. And new use cases are are interesting because you know you can even if you do have your database figured out and right sized and all of that stuff, suddenly you're doing something different, 
And so you've got an unplanned load. And then, you know, if you're suddenly hitting your database with a bunch of, of new requests, that can affect the functionality of your core product and you don't wanna want customers to have a bad experience. And um, as we've been discovering, sometimes your data is in one place and you would like it in another, um, you know, typically you want to store data near where it's used together. But in this, you know, sometimes you what you think you're going to need today um, ends up a little bit different than what you need tomorrow. Uh, one new feature that we're rolling out at DataStax this month, actually, to all of our customers is um, usage emails. So basically, every week we are sending um, our customers an email showing them the usage for all of the different profiles in their account. And this is actually my usage um, for last week. So, you know, you can see I spent a lot of time in the business category and I also spent 15 hours watching videos, apparently. Um, maybe I shouldn't have shared my data. Um, and then you can also, from the, the usage um, summary grid below, you can see, you know, about what time I get up most mornings and about what time I go to bed at night. So this has been a very interesting um, use case to develop because you know it started off just me sending a, a single email to myself of my own usage, and you know running it on my laptop, doing all of the queries and such. You know, from from click to email sent, it, it took about three seconds, which is pretty fast. But when you think about what about ten emails, that's still thirty seconds, no problem. Hundred emails. Five minutes, no problem. Thousand emails, then you're up to an hour, you know, and then 10,000, 100,000, million. Suddenly, by the time I'd be done sending all of the emails, it would already be more than a week later and we'd have to start sending out the next batch. And so, you know, obviously what I had running on my laptop wasn't sufficient and we had to, you know, come up with strategies to, to scale up. So it, it's been fun to play around with, with Astra to, you know, stick the data in there and to be able to then basically pump out emails very quickly. Let's jump to the next slide, please. All right, and speaking of moving quickly, that, that's a hard thing to do. And, and that's a problem because, you know, creating databases takes a lot of time. Um, and so, you know, as I said before, you could, with Astra, you can create a new database with just a few clicks. Um, and then we talked a little bit about you know, anticipating the sizing. But again, with Astra, start small and then grow. Um, one thing about POCs is sometimes you start something up and, and throw it away. Other times you start something up and it grows. But with Astra, again, it's really easy to create new data databases and throw away the ones that you don't want. And so if I'm creating a new service, I don't have to stress about, oh, do I want to connect to this database or create a new one? It's, it's a no brainer, just create a new database. Um, and then, you know, managing costs. If you're doing something small, um, that's very cheap. And, you know, most POC stuff, you're probably fine remaining even on the free tier. And then when you do go from a uh, proof of concept to GA or production, all you have to do is, is turn it up. And by turn it up, just start sending it more data and it will automatically scale. Um, I feel like I've been talking a lot and only hearing my voice. Um, so we can, uh, we'll wrap up this part, but let's quickly jump to the next slide. Um, for those of, like I said, we are a Go shop. And um, when I put out a, a, a repo on GitHub and if people are interested in wanting to connect up to Astra quickly, um, you know, GoSQL is kind of the de facto Golang library, but with Astra, you get the secure connect bundle, which has all of the certs and things like that. And it can be a little bit tricky to figure out how to connect up everything. And so what this, what this library does in my repo is basically you can just pass it your client ID, your client secret and your secure connect bundle, and it will, create and configure the GoCQL session for you. And then you... Oh, I think we might have lost Nathan for a second. So, uh, Nathan, if you can hear us. That is, yes, thank you very much. 
kind of lost you for the last minute or so, Nathan. Would you like to um, finish oh, up the last comment? Oh, no. Um, so did, did I start talking about Ghost EQL or, or yes. about my Yes, you will. Okay. So, so basically, if you want to connect, be able to connect to Go quickly and easily, um, you can my all you need is the username, password, and secure to um, easily to an Astro database and have all of your Cassandra goodness. Nice. I think if we want to put our uh, our you know conspiracy hats on, Zoom does not like you giving us all this awesome stuff because every time you tell us where to go find all this great stuff about your um, your your um, <clears throat> GitHub repo and stuff, it keeps dropping you and freezing you. But thank you so much, Nathan, for explaining your use case. That was phenomenal. Uh, I actually got really inspired by it. I'm like, ooh, because my kids are getting to the age where I'm going to need to do some of this stuff myself. Um, so this is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. That said, I have one question for you. When you were talking about uh, your scalable options uh, for, for Azure DB, you actually touched on something that I, I found really, really valuable. You said that it didn't matter for your use case how much storage and how much you needed to scale because you could it would automatically be able to scale um, near infinitely for your use case. How did you come to that conclusion for Astra? Because we get that question a lot, actually. How did I come to the conclusion with that we'd be able to scale as needed? Yeah, that you don't have to worry about storage or scalability because as your use case grows, Astra will uh, grow with you. So Astra has evolved over time and originally it had different size instances, but then just this year, you know, Astra went to all elastic. And so because of that, you know, I, I, I'm probably not the best person to talk about the architecture of Astra <laughs> behind the scenes, but you know, I know that as necessary, it adds more pods or whatever to, to grow as, as needed. And so, and I've seen it just from my own usage where as I, you know, push a little bit of, of data, it's fine. And then sometimes if I push a lot of data, sometimes I see right latency pick up a little bit and then suddenly it drops back down to normal. And you know, so far it's handled everything I've thrown at it. Wonderful, great. Thank you for answering my personal question. I know that was kind of rude to jump in. Uh, Harish, please, please feel free to take over the fireside chat portion of this uh, this presentation. Thank you, Nathan. I have a bunch of questions uh, to ask you. Let's start with the uh, circle itself. Can you talk a little more about uh, Circle Home Plus and uh, just a few details about the product? Uh, sure. So, you know, Circle, we're a cloud company. We have an app and you can install the app like on your, uh, you know, a cell phone or a tablet or Chromebook or whatever it is, you know, particularly, you know, devices that kids tend to use. And, and with that app, you can get all of the Circle goodness. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to, to install it and try it out, especially if you do have, have kids. Um, we, we've got a free trial and it, it's really cool stuff. And for many people, that app is enough for to meet their family's needs. And then there's other people like my family, for instance, we've got a lot of devices on our home network. We've got dozens and dozens of devices, you know, ranging from Arduinos and Raspberry Pis to smart TVs and gaming consoles and, and all of those sorts of things. And it's not you know, feasible to create or install apps on all of those devices. And so what the Circle Home Plus is, is a little box that you can plug into your network router, your home Wi-Fi, and you basically get all of the Circle goodness for all of those devices and any new devices that come on. My kids had some friends over last night for to, to eat pizza and play games. And then my phone buzzed and I saw that some new devices had joined our, our home network. Um, and it was my kids' friends' um, phones. You know, they give away our Wi-Fi password like candy. But, you know, I knew, I immediately knew what was happening and, and it was fine. And um, it also, you know, it's it's my house and, and my internet connection and my router. So it, it's also my rules um, for, you know, what the Wi-Fi is doing. 
So basically the Circle Home Plus is a device that gives you all of that circle goodness for all of the devices in your home. Interesting, thank you so much. Uh, now I jump into questions specific to Astro DB. So gentlemen, uh, Sean, Eric and Bala, please chime in uh, with wherever you have insights to add. So Nathan, you talked a lot about uh, scalability, ease of use and all the ad attributes of uh, Astro DB. But if you had to pinpoint that one attribute that stands out for you guys at Circle, which one would that be? Uh, the biggest attribute is definitely Cassandra. You know, it, it's called AstroDB, but it's it's backed by Cassandra, and Cassandra is awesome. You know, Cassandra, you can just keep adding nodes, and it'll it'll keep scaling. And I bet Sean can throw some cool numbers at you, <laughs> but you know, I, we want to deal with a lot of data. And, and Cassandra is great for doing that. Yeah, you know what? Let me, let me be the super nerd and throw a really crazy number at you. To give you an understanding of when we say near infinite scalability, we're talking about astronomical numbers. To give you a little insight as to how nerdy I am, the official formula to calculate the ranges of tokens to store data in Cassandra is negative two to the power of 63 to positive two to the power of 63 minus one. All right, real quick, who knows the answer? All right, the answer is that's about 18 quintillion. A quintillion means 15 zeros, okay? So we're working with 18 quintillion in range, just to indicate how crazy number that is, even NASA, right? NASA and all the space agencies around the world, they don't even use those numbers anymore. They talk about astronomical units, right? Because the human brain is not meant to use those kind of numbers. This is what Nathan was indicating. It's the sheer vastness of what Cassandra can bring to the table that is just phenomenal. So whether you use open source Cassandra, whether you use AstroDB, whether you use the Datastax enterprise version, you will still have that ability to have the crazy scalable um, range which is going to be near infinite levels. Um, the three biggest Cassandra users in the world, um, Apple, Netflix, and there's a company in um, China, I, I forget the name, that use it. And they have like these crazy amount of nodes across the globe, and they're not even close to scratching the surface of what Cassandra can do in terms of scalability. So that's uh, some crazy numbers for you, just to, just to indicate Alibaba, thank you so much, um, indicate you know, how large it can get. So whatever your use case, you are not limited by any kind of constraints for hardware. You are not limited by any kind of constraints for scalability. You know what the only constraints are? The speed of your network. That's going to be your only limitation. You can't go faster than the speed of light. Hence, you can't go faster than the speed of your network. That's going to be your only limitation. So with that, Harish, please go ahead. Awesome. So Nathan, for a beginner like me, who doesn't have really great experience with Cassandra yet, what are some quick tips to use AstroDB? And also, what do you think beginners should try with AstroDB first before they build something with it? Um, so first off, just create a database. It is easy to do. It's not going to be the last Astro database you create. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to get the name just right. Just create a database um, and, and get started. And then if you're like me, I, I learn best by, by doing and by having a project. And don't look at it as what can I do with Astra? That, that almost makes Astra sound like a problem, but Astra is really a, a solution and it's a great solution for data. So basically, you know, any sort of idea that you have, there is a very, very high chance that you're gonna have to deal with some sort of data. And so anytime you think of what am I gonna do with this data, think Astra. Um, last year, my daughter got a fish and a fish tank and all of that. And it was important to her to treat the fish right and make sure that the water was the right temperature. And so we, we hooked up, um, this is a, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this, this is a yeah. ESP8266 um, development platform, which is basically an Arduino with, with onboard Wi-Fi. So we hooked that up to a temperature sensor, plugged it in, and then what are we going to do with the data? We need to stick it somewhere. Well, being Astra is our solution. Um, you know, 
I don't think it was mentioned yet today, but Astra also has a REST interface where you, you can push data into Astra via REST. So it was easy to create um, you know, some code on, on that in the Arduino library to, to start pushing that information into an Astra database. And then once it was there, we could, you know, track the time series data. We could, you know, we actually have a TV in our um, kitchen. And so we added the dis that to the display so that you could see the temperature. So that is, you know, we're storing information for one device. You know, there's every minute, there's 10,080 minutes a week. That's not a lot of data. That is nothing compared to what Cassandra can handle, but it, it got us started playing around and you know it was a lot of fun so you don't have to have a huge use case you can have a very small and simple use case and you know figure out what data you've got and start sticking it into astra and and playing around with it yep harish let me add to what he said i think these are golden words i think for all of you developers who are going to build this app i think what he said should be taken to heart just do it right build the database and don't think of it as a problem i think that's a very important part right you should think of astra as your way to get over problems so use it for whatever you want to start building it and sean has told shown you multiple times and you know it's easy to build a database in astra right five clicks is all it takes right and those are simple clicks pretty intuitive anybody can do it so use it and the more you use it, the more comfortable you get. That's the only way to learn. Thanks, Harish. I was just going to quickly jump in. So I'm going to geek out for a second here, um, Nathan, because I was really impressed with your repo. So um, a few months ago, maybe it was, it was even last year, I had to. someone asked the question in terms of how do, we, how do they connect to Astra using GoCQL? Um, I've never, um, I'm not a Golang developer, so I had to quickly um, put something together and try and figure out. But um, recently we implemented MTLS. And I don't know if you know, Nathan, but um, we, in using my code, we started getting um, this error saying that uh, the certificate was um, invalid because it couldn't be verified. And so I quickly jumped into your repo and looked at your code and realized that, yeah, you do have server name in your TLS config. So well done. Thank you. Love it. It's awesome. Yeah, and sorry, everybody. I was actually trying to uh, open up some uh, links to share with everybody, and my my browser decided to unmute itself. So apologies for that. That was a commercial for um, a new TV show. Please ignore. Yeah. I, I think that's also the perfect segue for all the participants to go check out datastacks.com slash dev where you can literally try all these 10-minute uh, workshops and uh, play around with AstroDB. Definitely. Now, and, uh, yeah. Question for I, you, I, Arish. Question oh, for okay. you, because I want to just bring your video back up one more time, because um, this kind of ties into what was just being said. When you okay. when you first heard about, oh, it's only five clicks to get started. You had mentioned you were a traditional RDBMS uh, person. When you first experienced your Astra journey, so to speak. What was your experience as a new user to Astra? How did you feel? What did what was you know what was the things that stood out to you? Where were the things that you were like, wow, or this is something I need to invest more time in? Uh, a little unrelevant, but I'm a big fan of uh, no code, and uh, I think uh, creating a database as an experience on Astra DB platform was very similar to that. I didn't have to search anything; just create an account and just say create database and put some two names, right? The random names also work. I think that was the easiest part. And uh, the moment I saw REST API at the joy of, uh, of a guy who keeps working on APIs is brilliant. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just a click away, right? And GraphQL, I mean, it's inbuilt. You click and uh, try and run, create database and see what is happening with the database. I think from that experience as a no-code guy, you imagine I, I don't know any coding, I think it's a perfect way to create a database quickly in under five clicks and it was really under five clicks. So I'm really impressed when claims like that prove to be right. <laughs> that's, that's true, Harish, I agree. Claims and rights, so that's very true. 
<laughs> and the and the Netflix video I made uh, five minutes was just me talking uh, and giving an intro and walk through of the GitHub repo, but it really worked in under ten minutes if you really look at the video. So guys, everybody watching, go try it out, guys. You're missing out on a lot of uh, brilliant stuff out there if you're still working on RDBMS. Not saying you quit RDBMS, but uh, try out AstroDB. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's the, that's the right way to put it, Arish. So we don't get into controversies on RDBMS versus Cassandra. Each one has its use case, but yeah, but you know, for scalability, speed, Cassandra is virtually unbeatable. So yeah. nice. You can yeah. keep writing your toy applications on RDMA, RDBMS. You can keep <laughs> but once once you grow up and start, you know you need to write real applications instead of toy applications. Come over to the other side. Yeah, now now we are yeah now we are getting into the controversial stuff. Yeah, that's a diplomatic way of saying come over this side. But I agree with Eric that there comes a logical time when you got to make that switch, and you will feel it. You will see you know, the pressures of scale and flexibility hitting you bad. And that's when you would start thinking, is there an alternative? And yes, come this side is what we'll tell you. Exactly. Just speaking on the scalability idea, right? For all the panelists, what is elastic scalability for somebody who doesn't know it about it at all? Eric, would you so like to say that? Yeah, so with Cassandra, you can um, if if you had an on-premise um, installation, right? So let's say you're installing it on, in your own servers, you can start with um, just the minimum um, best practices three nodes, um, and as your uh, your requirements grow, as your throughput requirements or your um, you need more capacity, you just keep adding nodes, um, and you know I've worked on clusters that had three hundred nodes. Of work on clusters that had a thousand nodes, um, and similarly for Astra, um, when you start off, you'll start off with a, a small amount of compute, but as you need more, um, we can just keep scaling it out for you. Um, you might have you might start off with an application that you might have only have two thousand concurrent users, but you know, let's say your your application went viral and suddenly you now need to, to handle 100,000 uh, concurrent users. Hey, we can do that for you with just a flick of a switch. Yep. I love it when we say, oh, we can do that. We can just flick of the switch and stuff. It's like Harish said, you know, when, when we make those comments, people always look at us with, you know, with the crazy eye, like, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. So this would be a great question for Nathan. When we... And by we, I mean Eric, uh, Bala, and myself make those claims. Are we, are we blowing smoke up people's behinds, or are we telling the truth? Because you're an external user, you would be able to either confirm or deny our claims. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of this goes back to Astra's built on Cassandra, and Cassandra's awesome, but Cassandra can also be crazy hard, and um, you know, it's hard to configure it right you got to set up all of the nodes you've got to set up the you know replication factor the help dashboard the you know backups and things like that and and so fortunately Astra takes care of that lifting for you you know one thing that when you're starting off a new project you don't want to spend a week ordering hardware and and building something up from scratch you just want to click a button and go but then you know, very quickly, I, I'm sure many developers have been in the situation where they throw together a, a proof of concept and they show it to the powers that be and some executive says, that's great, let's ship it. And if you don't have, a, you know, a robust database backing you, you can be in trouble. But Astra, you know, I, I believe the default is it backs up every hour for a month or so, you know, and you like a month or, or whatever. And so just those sorts of features are adding to Cassandra and giving you all of that power and all of that flexibility with ease. And, you know, I don't have to worry about it. I just know that it's happening. Nice, I like that. And um, since we have a couple of minutes left and we're, we're, we're having a good time, do we need to prove our hypothesis that we can get done in five clicks or do we say we're good, everybody believes it? Because if you want, I can show everybody how quickly we can get started in five clicks to end today's session. Let's go. 
Go ahead, Sean. Let's do this. May I share my screen, Harish? All right. So just in case anybody was wondering, right, um, I'm going to add one more click. So I'm going to make it six clicks. And the only reason why is I want us to go from our build a modern data app launch platform, right? So this is our site. This is the hackathon site. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to click first click, right? Let's keep counting. First click. Now, because I am lazy, I don't want to type, I'm going to use my second click to log in with Google. So that's two so far. Now, from here, you can see, you know, I've been doing some of these demos uh, throughout the last couple of weeks. So I've, I've consumed some of my storage, but I've consumed barely anything. In terms of money spent, I have spent nothing. So that's cool. All right, so my third click, create database, three clicks. Okay, I'm just gonna use these two. Oh, now from here, the part that is interesting is depending on which cloud provider you want and which region you want, you have to select here, right? So I'm just gonna go with the default of North America. Actually, you know what? I'm going with Asia Pacific, why? Because most of our people are from that region. As you can see here on the right, we're ready to go. Oh, let's do that, let's call it. Ah, of course. Ah, that's why you never do a live demo. <laughs> live demos are supposed to be. Uh, lovely. So now there's obviously going to be more clicks because my live demo is not working, even though I had the same one a minute ago, but it's all good. So click number four, create the database. So while we're waiting on this to happen, right? It's pending. I'll show you the fourth or the fifth and sixth clicks. The fifth and sixth clicks are going to be connect fifth one. And the sixth click is going to be uploading of your data, right? Connect and loading of your data. Six clicks and my database is up and running. Now with that said, you can do anything from there. Now, once you have it up running and everything, you can actually connect to it through multiple different ways. We're just waiting on it to actually, uh, you know, start up. It takes about anywhere from two to four minutes, depending on the region and the availability in said region. But anybody, anybody who has this, as you can see, six clicks, your database is up and running. From here, you can get started on anything that you want, including the sample apps gallery, and let's go with the Netflix clone because Netflix clone is a uh, beginner one. I'll scroll down 10 minutes. You will have a Netflix clone in 10 minutes. So for those of you who want to try it out and just have a good time, that's what I recommend. For those of you who are more experienced, I would definitely uh, recommend going with your own versions. But as soon as the status goes from pending to active or up and running, you can actually start connecting through whatever way you wish. Does anybody have any questions about anything you're seeing on screen right now? Now is the time to ask. If you have no questions, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back over to Harish. Before you stop sharing, Sean, uh, can you just go to connect tab Great. and also show how to connect? Yeah. Yes. I was actually waiting for it to just switch over from pending to green, right? It's now active. As everybody could see, it took less than two minutes. Now, in this case, we have multiple different connection options. Obviously, all the Stargate options are right here, Document API, GraphQL API, REST API, but you are not limited to just those. You can use a driver, you can use an SDK, or you can use certain other tools that are available as well. Each one of these will explain exactly how to do it. And the cool part is, right, and this is the cool part, every single one will be specific to your database. So all of the code that you're going to need will already be adapted to what you need it to be for your database and your key spaces. So it literally is meant to be the most frictionless experience possible so anybody can connect. We're trying to make life easy for everyone. And of course, the most popular one, the REST API, will guide you through all the steps needed to connect. All right. With that said, let me stop. Before you, before you move on, Sean. Yes, sir. Keep sharing. I just want to make sure that every so that everyone's aware because um, one of the common questions that I keep getting asked is how do I know the endpoint, say for the REST API or the doc API, right? 
So if you could just scroll to where the Swagger UI is, just right there in the middle. If you click on that link, that Swagger UI will have a list of all the endpoints that you'd ever use, whether it's to it's an endpoint to create um, a new record in the database, whether it's a, uh, an endpoint to look up all the records that you've inserted. This is all there for you, ready to use. Awesome. Just awesome. so you don't have to figure it out on your own. That's actually a great tip. I actually made a note of that for myself. And then I have one final tip for everyone. Be bold, take a chance, right? No matter what your idea is, just go for it. The reason why I'm saying go for it is because we're not just trying to win a single hackathon. We're trying to change your life. We want to give everyone here the opportunity to build something that means something to you. So if you have an idea, even if you don't win, you can still qualify for the incubator program. Please go hard, try new things, be crazy, take a risk, take a chance. That's what the beauty of these hackathons is about. So I would like to hopefully motivate anybody here to really just try something new. Go, get, go outside your comfort zone. Find teammates that will help give you the pieces that you need to sustain to make a successful uh, pitch in an idea, right? Because you could have really good uh, front end skills, but need a back end uh, colleague to help you build this out. We have those people available. So please, please be bold, take a risk, go nuts, do something special. And I hope to see everybody again when we start doing our networking and our actual hackathon, because I'm really excited about all the group here. And I really, really wish every single one of you good luck. And I look forward to seeing your submissions. With that said, Harish, Asta, thank you for today. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for the quick demo. We are almost done with time. So I'm going to end it here. Thank you, Nathan, for joining us today and sharing your experience with AstroDB. And thank you, Bala, Eric, Sean, of course, for making this even better uh, by joining here. We'll see you all next week, same time on Saturday. Uh, we also have a pre-hackathon uh, networking session happening. If you don't know where to sign up, just check out Slack. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. We are just lurking around in Slack all the time. We'll answer your questions in just less than five minutes. With that, we come just, to the end of the session. Yeah, Asta. Just adding in but one thing very quickly, guys, uh, just to give you a reminder, next workshop, which is the last workshop in the series, is kind of important because we actually introduce the data stacks uh, uh, incubator program. So don't miss it out. Just re reminding you, this is happening next Friday. So just, just keep your calendars open around that. Next weekend is a busy weekend. And until then, see you all. Thank you for joining. Thank good you. night, good evening, good Thank morning, you. wherever you are. Thanks, Nathan. Bye. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, everyone, Thank for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye.